Uh, I took a little liberty with the title of this talk. Uh, I, I'm going to take you uh, kind of a, into a deeper dive into uh, uh, effects on atherogenic dyslipidemia as influenced by diet uh, and uh, atherosclerosis. These are my disclosures. I can see what the problem is here. So what is atherogenic dyslipidemia? Uh, it consists, I think as you probably all know, I'll just review it briefly, of a triad including high triglyceride levels, uh, and this translates to increased levels of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, or VLDL, low levels of HDL cholesterol, which is mainly due to a reduction in large HDL particles. And you can see already that I'm really moving from the standard lipid measurements to uh, something that more uh, accurately reflects their biological underpinnings, which are the particles in which they're transported. Uh, and then that relates, importantly, to LDL cholesterol. Since absolute levels of LDL cholesterol are commonly not increased, but there is an increased number of LDL particles which are uh, what are transporting the cholesterol in the blood. Uh, this is uh, also reflected in increased levels of apoprotein B, which is the structural protein of LDL. You just heard about that from Dr. Mente. Uh, uh, and it's a measure of total particle number, number both LDL and VLDL. Uh, and uh, the LDL uh, that is found in atherogenic dyslipidemia uh, is actually small and cholesterol depleted LDL particles. Uh, and it's this, as I'll show in a moment, uh, lower levels of cholesterol in the particle that uh, is reflected in the fact that the absolute levels of LDL in the blood are not elevated while the particle numbers are. So this is the framework. Uh, in fact, this is the work that I started to do when I came to California a few decades ago, uh, interested in lipoproteins and nutrition, uh, uh, and was really quite thunderstruck by the fact that LDL cholesterol, when we started digging into it, was really not a single entity at all. Uh, it reflects cholesterol across a spectrum of, uh, of particles uh, that are uh, found, and I'm not, I won't try to use the pointer here, just take it from the top to the bottom, uh, large uh, and, and cholesterol-rich particles that float to the top of the tube, shown on the right, uh, down to the small and very small particles that are cholesterol and lipid depleted and sink to the bottom. So this is large buoyant versus small dense. The small dense have a number of properties that I won't talk about here for lack of time uh, that render them uh, more uh, likely candidates for causing vascular disease in the larger particles. They have a lower plasma clearance from the bloodstream. LDL are taken up, as I'll show in a moment, through receptors, mainly in the liver. These particles are cleared more slowly uh, and tend to spend more time in the blood where they can do uh, some nasty things when they hit the arteries. They're retained in the arteries more uh, tightly than larger particles. They're also oxidized more rapidly, which uh, makes them uh, even more toxic when they become uh, inflammatory as a result of that. Uh, and again, uh, for lack of time, I won't be able to give you all of the information. It's in literature, it's really quite extensive, that has tried to examine the relationship of LDL particles uh, to cardiovascular risk. This is uh, somewhat methodology dependent. There are some methods that are better than others. Uh, this is one of uh, several studies that, to my mind, uh, really convincingly shows that there is a discordance between um, the relationship of uh, large uh, buoyant LDL on the right uh, and small dense LDL on the left to cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, this is in a very large cohort, the ERIC study, where the quartiles of small dense LDL cholesterol on the left are progressively related to increased risk, very compatible with what we've always said about cholesterol, but this is now uh, the small dense variety and it really is reflected in the particles themselves whereas there's absolutely no relationship at all for the large buoyant. And this is one of two studies that came out uh, in the last couple of years that has, I think, really nailed it tight. I do want to show one of our studies um, that uh, is related to the same question. Uh, and now I can see, okay. Uh, using a different method, uh, uh, which we've uh, developed, which actually measures particle concentrations called ion mobility. Uh, and this is a study we carried out in collaboration uh, with Paul Ritker and Sammy Amora uh, at Harvard uh, on a, uh, one of the landmark statin intervention trials, the Jupiter trial. This is actually in the placebo group, so this was really a baseline relationship of uh, particle concentrations to outcomes in untreated individuals, 5,600 of them. 
Uh, and uh, here is a whole spectrum of particles on the left, the VLDL on the right, the LDL getting smaller. And you'll see that there is a profile here. And it's this profile that's important. And this gets back to the concept of a dyslipidemia. It's not necessarily one single measurement, but it's a constellation of measurements that creates risk in the situation. And I don't need to tell this audience that this is really uh, not just uh, a, a phenomenon uh, that uh, relates to a, a subset of the population, it's really the majority of the population that has risk associated with this trait. Large VLDL uh, on the left, um, medium and small LDL in the middle, uh, and then a second uh, peak, a very small. So we discovered that there's yet another flavor of small LDL uh, getting even smaller than small. So we had to call it very small. And we're currently working on an ultra small, uh, which, uh, but, uh, uh, which we're going to try to uh, uh, add to the uh, uh, equation. Uh, and so that's how I keep going. I just keep uh, inventing different forms of LDL. I'm only kidding. Uh, so, so you'll see uh, at the very right, there is a, there's a funny looking symbol. I don't know what it's called. That, that says that the very smallest particles are uh, associated actually with death, uh, not just cardiovascular events, and that's independent of lipids. So there's something about these particles as they get smaller that makes them more dangerous, and the smaller the worse. Now I'm gonna kind of switch gears a little bit because this is, um, uh, I'm gonna really focus on metabolism for the rest of the talk and try to give you some underpinnings uh, of uh, how this profile develops and, and what it might mean in terms of other characteristics that might be more relevant to some of your interests here uh, in nutrition and ketogenic diets. Uh, so this is another discovery that I made just by noodling around with methodology unexpectedly. Um, a, another method that allowed us to separate particles also by size called gradient gel electrophoresis. Uh, and on the top, you, show, you see the VLDL, IDL, uh, LDL spectrum again, uh, at this time a, a tracing that shows the relative amounts of these particles. Um, and on the lower part is the HDL showing two flavors of HDL. But the point of showing this is that um, in looking at my patients, because uh, I also derive a tremendous amount of information from just seeing patients in the clinic, and I was applying this method to our clinic population, all of a sudden I saw this profile that just looked different. And I'm, a, I'm kind of a pattern recognition guy. Uh, and so I saw this is a different pattern. So we called it uh, 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 pattern A and pattern B, and this was a kind of a little notation I had on my lab notebook that I thought I could eventually improve upon, but we've just kind of left it A and B for better or for worse, and it has sort of uh, stuck because it really does represent a distinct profile. And the distinctness of that profile is further manifest uh, in another way. And this is, again, something I, I'm going to use this audience as a way to sort of advertise something that um, is kind of buried in the literature. There is a bimodal distribution uh, of peak LDL particle size in the population using every method that I've ever applied to, to LDL analysis. Uh, as shown here with the gradient gel, uh, the peak particle diameter of LDL follows a bimodal distribution. And there's people uh, uh, on the left who are uh, the ones that I just showed you with the B phenotype, and the ones on the right are the pattern A. Uh, and so this is in a healthy population, not obese. This is just a manifestation of their in, in, intrinsic metabolic differences. Uh, and what's really cool about this is that these discrete phenotypes, they're really you know, categorical, like you know, eye color, probably even <laughs> as easy to read as eye color. Uh, on the bottom, you see that the A and the B uh, lipid values uh, and ApoB values correspond uh, to individuals with and without the metabolic syndrome or atherogenic dyslipidemia. The phenotype A people, normal triglyceride, normal HDL, uh, normal ApoB, phenotype B, higher triglyceride, lower HDL, LDL cholesterol identical, uh, but ApoB higher. So this is really, to me, the canonical definition of atherogenic dyslipidemia shown using a discrete marker of LDL size. So I'm going to, uh, actually, the, the, most of the rest of my presentation today will be focusing on what we've learned metabolically, physiologically, and nutrition-wise um, by f focusing in on these, uh, on these traits, and particularly the distinction uh, between uh, phenotype A and phenotype B. E. And this is just uh, to illustrate in another way that these phenotypes are very closely related to triglyceride. Um, here you see that um, if you take a triglyceride, this is a log triglyceride on the x-axis. And um, can you help me with advance? 
um, on the x-axis and the peak particle diameter on the right. Does this work? Oh, oops, no. Can we go back? Okay. Um, there are two clusters of points. Um, there are those uh, in the upper left, uh, which represent uh, the larger LVO and the uh, lower triglyceride, and those on the, uh, uh, on the right that represent the, the uh, higher triglyceride and the smaller LVO. So these, this is really another way of illustrating it, the bimodality, if you sort of blur your vision a little bit, you can see it there, these two clusters. Uh, but triglyceride is a much mess, more messy variable than the particle size. It's one reason that the bimodality doesn't show up for triglyceride because it's there under the surface. So how do these phenotypes develop? Uh, I'm going to take you a little bit into the world of metabolism because I think it helps illustrate uh, the biology uh, and how it relates to the clinical measurements. Uh, that the uh, particles we're talking about originate in the liver. This is really uh, getting to be <laughs> weak. Um, as a, um, uh, a stream of particles, uh, with triglyceride being loaded up into VLDL, when the triglyceride pool in the liver is low, when you don't have much fat in the liver, it makes smaller VLDL, and that gives rise to larger LDL particles. So just got to get your brain around the fact that smaller VLDL make larger LDL. They're cleared effectively by the LDL receptor. But the bad stuff happens uh, when triglyceride is loaded up. And this is where we start getting into issues that we've been talking about uh, at this meeting. Uh, very importantly, is uh, uh, putting more fat in your liver makes larger VLDL come out. Those create remnants. They're very slowly metabolized. So this is a much slower pathway. And that, and that dynamic is very important to understand because this gives rise to a series of downstream effects, including the production of smaller LDL and very small LDL that are cleared, as, uh, as I mentioned, less effectively by the LDL receptor. So this whole uh, pathway that originates with these uh, big, uh, fat-filled VLDL is just sluggishly moving its way around the circulation and causing damage uh, almost at every step of the way. The remnants are bad, the small LDL are bad, and the very small LDL may be worse. And this is the phenotype, phenotype, phenotype AB uh, dichotomy. This is, uh, if, <laughs> I hope there's no lab of uh, no serious lipoprotein experts in the crowd, probably there are, uh, because this is an oversimplification. I can be criticized for ignoring the fact that there's, that there's multiple steps along the way, but this really crystallizes, I think, the key to these two uh, distinct pathways that are illustrated by the bimodality of LDL size. Uh, and uh, just to, to say the obvious, and that is that adiposity is also a determinant of the small LDL phenotype. This shows relationships in 600 people that we studied a few years ago. It's just the expected relationship uh, as one has a higher BMI. And it's, of course, abdominal. If we put waist circumference here, it would be even stronger. We don't have all those measurements. Um, it's related to visceral adiposity, as everyone knows. So this uh, slide illustrates where uh, my um, uh, kind of vision of what we should be eating uh, started to turn. Uh, it's when we started to develop data that are summarized on this slide. And what are shown uh, uh, are, uh, are two lines uh, relating uh, dietary composition that we changed in various of our uh, own trials, uh, changing uh, the composition uh, in terms of substituting uh, carbohydrate for fat, initially trying to study low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets as a healthy diet. Uh, but we then looked at phenotype B on the, on the y-axis as an outcome. And uh, this is, again, a summation of a number of studies. The very first study we did just kind of surprised me because uh, we were able to show that higher carbohydrate diets weren't more healthy. They actually induced uh, increased prevalence of phenotype B such that over the course of these multiple studies, there was a strong linear relationship as the carbohydrate went up um, and the fat went down, the prevalence of phenotype B got higher. Um, we found this true for uh, men. We, interestingly, premenopause of women are relatively protected uh, from this trait, which is, I think, reflected also in their lower risk of heart disease. But even there, we saw a, a relationship with carbohydrate intake. And so we were um, inclined to think that there might be some genetics going on here, and we've done some studies there, which I won't be able to talk about but um, in detail, but uh, that there's something driving this relationship, uh, people being more or less susceptible 
uh, to carbohydrate intake. And as you got to higher intakes, you got more and more people who started to express this trait. So this trait was something that was very sensitive to dietary carbohydrate. But obviously, uh, having shown that we could make people worse by increasing carbohydrate, uh, we decided to uh, do a good thing, and that is take the carbohydrate in the other direction. And that's where I, uh, I, I made the pivot <laughs> from the, the high carbohydrate to low carbohydrate. We were saying, well, maybe lower carbohydrate is beneficial. So we did a study uh, which was published, uh, I guess, quite some time ago now, in which we took individuals uh, who were already uh, overweight, who had a high prevalence of atherogenic dyslipidemia, and this shows their bimodal distribution with a very uh, big peak for the phenotype B on the left, for nearly half of them had phenotype B um, on their standard diet, if you will, uh, and then when they were uh, uh, switch to a lower carbohydrate diet. Not a you know. So I'm I'm not going to. None of our studies have really involved very low carb. But this is just a switch within uh, the uh, carbohydrate range that many of us, many people eat uh, normally. Um, but what we found was that um, there was a dramatic conversion in nearly 40 percent of the phenotype B individuals. Uh, in, a, in a quantum jump. So again, there's this sort of quantum flip. It's not as if they kind of you know, moved gradually uh, to smaller LDL. They flipped uh, into uh, the phenotype A profile just by lowering the carbohydrate by 15%, keeping uh, the fat constant uh, and changing the protein. Um, we did a lot of work with saturated fat in the context of these and other studies, which uh, I don't have time to talk about in detail. I'll just show you this one result that uh, typifies uh, others that we've done, because obviously the question has been, continues to be with um, uh, higher fat diets, lower carb, are you uh, damaging uh, cardiovascular risk? We heard about that in the last talk, and I'll talk about it here uh, in a different context. Um, here are the uh, three carbohydrate levels on the x-axis. We actually studied not two, but three. So we took it down to 26% uh, uh, in our lowest carbohydrate level. So it's getting close to the range of interest here. Uh, and on that lower carbohydrate diet, we uh, fed high versus low saturated fat. And the high saturated fat is 15% in blue, um, and the, the yellow is the, uh, the basic 8% diet, which was the, the, the basic, the basal diet. And you'll see that LDL cholesterol on the left was higher, uh, as expected. Look on the right, though. The small LDL, nothing. Uh, not a glimmer. So there's, so the small LDL concentration has absolutely no relationship to saturated fat intake. Um, as you go to the larger LDL, that's where the, the saturated fat uh, effect occurs. And we've shown this now several times. It doesn't apply to all people universally. There are patients in whom we see um, a more ad, um, a, a differential profile. But this is the a canonical response uh, that it's the larger LDL that go up. And so you can draw your conclusions based on what we talked about regarding uh, LDL and its role in atherosclerosis. Um, and so we did a um, further analysis on these three carbohydrate levels uh, before weight loss, and then we also had them lose weight um, with a thousand calorie reduction, about 7% of their body weight. And we saw a relationship with phenotype B and carbohydrate intake with uh, both before and after weight loss, but the slopes differed. And they, if we took them down now here at the very lowest level, we start getting into the extrapolations that might relate uh, to the uh, extremely low carbohydrate ketogenic range. And you can see that, in theory, it could be capable of reversing um, phenotype B even further. Um, uh, weight loss, obviously, is effective in its own right, but carbohydrate would be effective even in the um, absence of weight loss, and they both converge on that same level. So both carbohydrate intake reduction and weight loss um, can um, uh, re reverse phenotype B uh, quite substantially. Uh, and these convergent effects of these two uh, interventions suggest that they may be operating through common pathways. And so what we think is, as shown on the left, that each of these may operate in part, at least, by flipping um, hepatic lipid metabolism out of the B mode into the A mode. And that could be accomplished by carbohydrate restriction as well as weight loss. So in the last uh, few minutes, I want to uh, take you into a, a uh, some observations that we made in the conjunction with these and subsequent studies that, um, that are kind of uh, intersect with some of the interest here in, in ketogenic diets, as you'll see. Um, we noticed in the uh, study I just described 
that uh, we had more trouble getting the phenotype B people to lose weight um, on the same level of calories. We actually measured calories, we measured caloric uh, expenditure, we measured um, uh, physical activity. Uh, and, and yet we, we saw that they were not losing as much fat. So we did a study in which we specifically asked, uh, is there a difference in the uh, capacity of a, um, a, a low calorie diet uh, to reduce adiposity in phenotype B versus phenotype A? Is there some resistance to that? Uh, and uh, so you see the A and the B subjects here uh, uh, as a function of the BMI ranging from 25 to 30. These were uh, moderately overweight. Our goal was to get them down to less than 25. Uh, and despite all of our efforts, uh, there were a significant number of individuals who failed to make that conversion from B to A, shown in the red box. They remained phenotype B. Uh, they remained uh, overweight. Uh, and, and there were some individuals, interestingly, who did lose weight and remained phenotype B. Uh, we think these are the genetically hardwired people that even if you lose weight, are, can't make their uh, LDL larger. We see people like that as well. But the, but the people in the red box were particularly of interest because these are the folks that just couldn't make the grade, and we, and we didn't think it was compliance. We did a lot of careful measurements. Um, uh, a higher proportion of phenotype B failed to meet their BMI target. So we looked at uh, this more carefully by um, uh, baseline uh, and, and final LDL subclass patterns, and the people uh, who remain phenotype B at the very bottom line, the B to B individuals, uh, just lost less weight. They lost less fat as well. No differences in physical activity, resting energy expenditure, or change in resting energy expenditure. So we were uh, having trouble explaining this. Uh, we thought it was real. We saw it twice. What's the basis for this reduced uh, body fat loss in these individuals? Could the metabolic abnormalities underlying phenotype B be related uh, to a problem burning fat? Because after all, you need to burn, as I don't need to tell this audience, uh, you, know, you want to burn fat uh, to lose weight. So we uh, had measured in this uh, latter study um, a, 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 you know, the a crude measure of fat oxidation using, um, uh, using indirect calorimetry, and as you know, the uh, baseline respiratory quotient, the uh, higher it is, uh, the lower the fat oxidation. And we just looked at triglyceride as well as peak particle diameter, and we found a relationship. That is, the higher the triglyceride and the smaller the LDL, uh, the uh, greater the impairment uh, in fat oxidation. That relationship uh, uh, mirrored something we'd seen in our previous study as well. It was not super strong, but it was significant. We did a second study under exercise, a smaller study with collaboration with George Brooks's group at Berkeley uh, with, uh, with exercise uh, um, and measured RQ during exercise. And again, the triglyceride in, in that uh, group of individuals uh, was also linearly related to impaired fat oxidation. So then we went back and looked at the weight loss in our weight loss study to see if that was also related to triglyceride at baseline uh, and respiratory quotient at baseline, and indeed uh, stronger for triglyceride and uh, inversely for LDL size. So again, these two things go together, smaller LDL, higher triglyceride, um, less weight loss per kilocalorie reduction. So this was an effort to try to quantitate the efficacy of a, this weight loss intervention, and it was independently related to triglyceride uh, and, some, and LDL size. So uh, this is kind of allows me to lead into a speculation that we uh, would, would love to be able to prove, and that is that perhaps reduced uh, tissue fatty acid oxidation underlies both uh, a tendency towards adiposity and the atherogenic dyslipidemia. Uh, there's a causal relationship between adiposity and the dyslipidemia shown on the bottom, but maybe there's an underlying fundamental defect in fatty acid oxidation that's responsible for both, and this reflected in these relationships I showed. What mechanisms might be involved? I've got a couple of minutes at the end, three, to uh, uh, try to give you my hypothesis. Perhaps it's reduced uh, triglyceride clearance, and I can't show you the data behind this, but there is a well-recognized uh, relationship of reduced VLDL clearance. Remember I told you that uh, small, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, pattern B pathway is a slow pathway, and so that involves reduced VLDL clearance uh, as a very important determinant of atherogen dyslipidemia. And we and others have shown that uh, hydrolysis of VLDL triglyceride provides endogenous ligands for important uh, uh, transcriptional proteins, PPAR-alpha and PPAR-delta, 
uh, that influence tissue fatty acid oxidation. Uh, and I won't be able to show you those data, but there are three references there. So um, what we finally are suggesting, and this is way out in the future to prove, we're gonna to try to get some funding to prove it at some point, is that perhaps reduced plasma triglyceride clearance uh, underlies um, a, uh, an effect that contributes to reduced tissue fatty acid oxidation, perhaps adding on to genetic and other dietary factors. And that, uh, in, in the blue box, uh, is the precursor of both the dyslipidemia and um, a difficulty losing weight. So there may be some intrinsic issues regarding weight loss efficacy that might be reflected um, by this uh, abnormality in triglyceride metabolism. So in the bottom, I'd say atherogenic dyslipidemia, this bimodal distribution of, uh, of LDL size is a marker for reduced fatty oxidation and perhaps uh, susceptibility to obesity. So that's uh, something I'm leaving uh, uh, out there because uh, this may have implications for uh, the response to ketogenic diet. Uh, it may be that we have to push harder uh, in these individuals uh, to overcome intrinsic defects in fatty acid oxidation and the ketogenic diet certainly provides a way of doing that. So uh, finally, in conclusion, uh, I'd say the small LDL phenotype is a marker for and a, path and a pathogenic component of. So it's both a diagnostic marker as well as a pathophysiologic agent, which is not true for all markers. Uh, uh, obesity, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome. This is really um, a way to fingerprint that syndrome. Uh, the trait can signify impairment of fatty acid oxidation, possibly linked to reduced VLDL clearance as a contributor to both dyslipidemia and adiposity, uh, and that um, uh, 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 both reduced carbohydrate intake and adiposity decrease expression of the small LDL pathway, uh, and then throwing in um, just the one other point about saturated fat uh, does not influence this pathway. It has an effect uh, on, uh, on larger LDL, which may not have the same impact on risk. So uh, these are the folks uh, in our group that are uh, responsible for this work, our collaborators, George Brooks and George Bray. So thanks for your attention.